Jeffrey Tucker is a world-famous crypto economist and decentralization advocate. In this interview, he talks about the 2017 bubble, his personal strategies, and the importance of 2019. We compiled the only exclusive report found online with Jeffrey's most important notes over the years. It is a must to understand his expertise. Go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Jeff. Welcome to Cryptocurrencies, the future of digital money show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back our friend, Mr. Jeffrey A. Tucker. Jeffrey is the editorial director of the American Institute for Economic Research. He is the author of five books and the founder of the Cryptocurrency Conference. He is a very strong Bitcoin advocate and a research affiliate of the Blockchain Innovation Hub at RMI. IT University. Jeffrey, welcome back to the show. It's good to be back here again. It's fantastic to have you. Also, at this time, we've dropped from 20,000 to 3,500 in Bitcoin. We want to talk to you about sure. it. <laughs> Jeffrey, to start off, in hindsight, was 2017 damaging to this sector? In other words, were there too many speculators, meaning people who invested just because they could and not because they actually understood the cryptocurrency world? I think speculation is an inevitability in every market, and you're going to get that, especially on something that went from you know, basically zero uh, to 20, 20, 20 K in, in, in seven years. It was, it was crazy. That's going to attract a lot of speculation. There's, there's nothing we can do about that. Um, and I, I totally understand it. I mean, even, even now, uh, cryptocurrency has been the best investment of the last decade, hands down, no, no competitors, you know, so there's no question about that. Uh, people who got in at the top are, are now frust frustrated and suffering. I'm guessing that, um, of course, nobody knows the future, but my, my guess is that if you, if you hold on, uh, things are going to be fine. It might, it might take another year or another couple of years or something to fully recover. But, you know, I've, I've, since I've been in the sector so long, I, I recall when it, you know, when it crashed from 300 or really 1,000 down to 300, and everybody was panicking and saying Bitcoin is dead and so on, and the people who bought at the top were, were angry. Mm -hmm. And then later, thought they were the smartest guys in the world. So that's just the way markets are. But if you want to talk about something that went wrong in 2017, I would say this. And I, and I don't usually talk about the subject because, um, because it's a sensitive one. Um, but I'm, I'm feeling ever more convicted about it. Um, Bitcoin Core did not adapt to accommodate uh, more users in 2017, there were, these discussions were going on in 2015, 2016. And by, uh, by the first and second quarters of 2017, it was actually shocking that the user experience of Bitcoin had completely transformed. We went from having a very fast, uh, super cheap, almost free transactions to paying far more for a transaction of Bitcoin than you would in uh, a credit card and even waiting just as long. I mean, so, I mean, Bitcoin was not prepared to scale uh, at all because uh, the developer team had uh, decided to go for uh, elegance of code over usability. And it really transformed the entire sector because then in August of 2017, we had the big fork with the Bitcoin Cash, which in retrospect was, you know, it was a regrettable move, but it was an emergency move because we had to have a crypto that you could use. And now uh, Bitcoin core dominance of the market is down to 50%. And it's sunk as low, I think. I well, hope I'm not mistaken. This is as low as 30%. And, and even yesterday, because we had, you know, we're getting more bullish sentiment, sentiment now hitting the markets again. If you were watching the mempools uh, on, on the data pages, they went through the roof yesterday. And sure enough, we were back to the same old problem, very expensive transactions. The miners were deprecating any uh, tra transaction that wasn't paying a, uh, a lot of money to, and, uh, to, to get the transactions done. And so therefore the transactions weren't going through. And I have friends of mine that, that were waiting as long as two days. And so that is just bad code. And, it's, and, it's, and, and I don't care how you look at it, that was a tremendous uh, failing on the part of the Bitcoin core development team. Wow. Yes. Now, is there any value 
to the thousands of altcoins that are out there? Or are investors just putting their money into unregulated startup companies with little oversight? Uh, both are true. <laughs> so uh, there's a tremendous value to all the non-Bitcoin core uh, uh, coins, and a lot of them were made necessary because of the scaling problems of Bitcoin itself. And so uh, uh, things like a Smart Cash and uh, Horizon, uh, Bitcoin Cash, and even even a BSV, which is a fork of Bitcoin Cash, the, these all have use cases, and they're made essential and necessary. Uh, because uh, uh, because we have to have uh, cheap, fast transactions, or else we're not going to get cash for the internet. Um, on the company side, what's fascinating to me is to watch what's happened over the course of 2018, where most people have said that uh, you know this is a disastrous year. It's actually been the best year for blockchain technology ever. It's been all adopted by major banks. We've got tremendous innovation in Providence Proof and titling. Like the sector is growing ever more robust. There are plenty of companies out there that started in 2017 that just attached the name blockchain, you know, to, to anything. And then you've got a lot of investment capital. Those is <laughs> by now just been almost completely eliminated from the markets. So I think we're on much more firm footing right now than we were in 2016. Perfect. Now, Jeffrey, shifting gears just a little bit, are you surprised that the USD is the best performing asset of 2018 with 90% of overall global assets down for the year? This is the first time that this has occurred since 1917. Uh, that, I've not heard that statistic. It actually makes sense. The dollar is relative to all other fiat currencies, mm -hmm. a very sound currency because it's 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 backed by by uh, the enormously prosperous American uh, capital sector at this point. I mean, that's what people are evaluating the currencies according to the strength of the economy, and the U.S. economy has been very strong. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to maintain that uh, in the coming years, given the existing uh, trade policies. But right now, it seems pretty solid. The other thing to remember is that. The policies of the Federal Reserve have been relatively restrictive, even all the way since uh, 2008. There was a huge expansion of the monetary base, but the banking system was uh, uh, rigged a little bit by the Federal Reserve, so they were massively disincentivized from any kind of uh, robust credit expansion. So what that, the end result of that was a fairly tight monetary policy over the last 10 years, and that's result, resorted in, in just as a matter of supply and demand showing up the value of the dollar relative to, uh, to other, con uh, other countries, uh, other currencies. So that's not entirely surprising. Um, I, it's interesting when you want to try to do counterfactuals. I wonder what the world would look like right now if Bitcoin had scaled properly in 2017 when it was needed most, uh, what the world would look like right now. It's impossible to say because you can't do these controlled experiments in the social sciences, but I think we'd be in a much different situation today. Oh, that. yeah. Wow. Transparency means everything, right? And there hasn't yeah. been much up until yeah. now. So in your opinion, back to Bitcoin, is the sell-off over? What do you think? Well, that's a hard thing to... Uh, I, so I thought it was probably over in the spring, and I thought it was over in the, in the <laughs> right. summer, and then over in the fall. It's over now. And now it's over now. And, and, but I have to tell you, though, early in this year, and I, I hang around at the Atlanta Bitcoin Embassy, a, a lot of people that are really have a, a lot of good intuitions about this. And I, I had the number uh, 3,000 being thrown around uh, earlier this year as being the, the market bottom. So that, that was already something that people were talking about um, uh, early in 2018. So... Um, I'm, I'm thinking that it probably is, you know, the, the fork of Bitcoin Cash really caused a, a tremendous amount of disruption in the market that ends up being very artificial. So what happened is we had some big whales in the space that were massively dumping uh, Bitcoin over the last uh, three weeks um, mm -hmm. and investing tremendous amounts of mining power in this what really amounted to a hash war between uh, uh, 
uh, Bitcoin Cash and, and uh, Bitcoin SV, which stands for Satoshi's Vision. And that led to what appeared to be a tremendous amount of waste and also a lot of market distortion. Um, now that that's settled down, I've, the last 48 hours, I think we're starting to see some, some bullish sentiment come back. So I, it's hard for me to predict the timing, mm -hmm. but I know for sure, I mean, I can't say I know for sure, but I'm, I'm feeling very good about the prospects for cryptocurrency and, and even Bitcoin Core in particular as being, uh, uh, I'm pretty bullish on it. Just, you know, let's give a range of, of three years or something like that. In fact, everybody I know who's been in the space for as long as I have, and a lot of people who just started in 2015 are extremely bullish. Right. And so your opinion is just because it's dropped from 20 grand down to 3,500, you see this as a prime buying opportunity. Thank you, lucky stars. You can get in rather than yeah, run I for the hill. I was going to say on, um, when we just went through Black Friday in the United States for all these sales, I was like, well, we got, we got a sale on Bitcoin today too. You know? so, <laughs> exactly. If, if, well, the other thing is, I mean, from my perspective, you know, as a, as, a, as a percentage drop, this is not unusual in the Bitcoin world. It's just that as the price goes up, the stakes uh, grow. You know, co companies that seem to be hugely capitalized suddenly, you know, lose half their assets. That's a tremendously shocking thing. But, you know, again, I try to remind people about this. This is a new technology and in these kinds of new techno spaces, you're going to get a lot of strange behavior. Uh, this happened with railroads, it happened in flight, it happened in the internet. I mean, I remember in 1997, people were saying, oh, there'll no, there's no way to make money in the internet. The companies that tried, people got really optimistic about it. All those companies crashed in 1999, and everybody said, see, we're right, there's, the, there's no future for commerce on the internet. Well, three years later, you know, we saw what happened. They were all back, and now... Right. The, the top five ca capitalized companies in the world are entirely digital commercial companies. Can't so, do without it now. Yeah. Wow. Now, are you personally taking advantage of this downturn? Are you investing in anything? Are you buying the dip, Jeffrey? <laughs> well, <laughs> most, most people who are, are, are enthusiasts for, for cryptocurrency buy in every single dip. That uh, may not, you know, so, you know, back in the early days, um, people would buy at $10, they'd buy at $5, they'd buy at $3, they'd buy at $1 until they're completely out of money. So <laughs> this, is, this is the behavior <laughs> of people. So, and in fact, you know, what's interesting, um, uh, in, this year alone, you've seen a dramatic rise in, in uh, cryptocurrency transactions and you can look at all the data. That's really what's, what's fun about all this stuff. Right. During the time when everybody's once again issuing uh, obituaries for cryptocurrency <laughs> <R. I>. actually <laughs> seeing, yeah, use actually going through the roof. So, um, uh, you know, uh, right now, like one of the biggest highest performing sectors in our, in the space are Bitcoin ATMs. Actually, they're, they're, they can't manufacture them fast enough. There's a huge market for these things and they're going up all over the country. So people, people love it. When, yeah. and this is the thing, smart people learn to buy, when times are calm and where prices are low, mm -hmm. and then uh, and 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 the the unsophisticated investors look at low prices and calm times as a, as a sign to just get depressed and not do anything. So that's the difference between sm smart and dumb. You're supposed to buy when it's low, not when it's yeah. high. That's it. <laughs> that's the equation. Yeah. Now shifting gears again just a little bit, has Bitcoin helped? countries that have suffered through crisis in 19 uh, rather in 2018 such as Venezuela or any of those other countries what are your thoughts yeah Bitcoin uh, cryptocurrency in general has become an essential component of the world economy essentially and you see it most presciently in these countries like like Venezuela where uh, you know the country the, 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 the money completely failed and, and uh, Bitcoin and Dash and Smart Cash and there's some other really nice uh, tokens that are in very common use right now in Venezuela. I mean, you think about it, it's, you know, cryptocurrency has saved lives. It's, it's been an essential tool and whether it's mining or using for taxi rides or for purchasing groceries, it's been absolutely essential. Developed world too, interesting. I was talking to a guy last night who just moved from New York and he didn't know I was interested in cryptocurrency or whatever. And he was just in Atlanta. 
And he said that uh, he and his partner were out shopping for homes and they found a home they really liked and wanted to buy it. And the guy said, well, uh, I'll, I'll sell it to you, but I, will, I won't accept uh, dollars. I'll only accept Bitcoin. So um, wow, just simply would not sell. This is in Atlanta, would not sell the home for anything but Bitcoin. Um, and he's telling me the story and without any knowledge of who I am or, or anything of my writing, I'm like, well, that is a really fascinating story. So, you know, when you hear stories like that, it, 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 it shows you where we're headed. And yeah. People really believe in this stuff. It's extraordinary. Well, you see it all over everywhere, except, you know, we accept Bitcoin, we accept cryptocurrency. I even see it, you know, in places that are completely surprising. Craigslist sometimes selling things, yeah. you know, I accept. It's usually the larger items, you know, like dining room sets and things like that. But right. people who are looking to sell large ticket items everywhere. Yeah, but this is, this is I think, a, uh, this is a, a home, I'm just estimating the price at about one and a half million dollars. And the guy just would not accept anything but uh, Bitcoin for the, for, for the purchase of it. That's I, think that's so really, interesting. I think that's really interesting, you know, because like, it's funny that you have that going on on one hand, but I was listening to National Public Radio this morning and they mentioned Bitcoin in passing. And they said, Bitcoin, a currency used by online drug dealers, uh, terrorists, and money launderers. That's, that's what they described it as. Yeah, that's what they actually said on wow. National Public Radio this morning. I was just sitting there thinking, I can't believe that we're at this late stage and you're still getting this kind on of news. On NPR? Yeah. It was this morning. Oh, it my was funny. God. We were talking about it in the context of hacking or something like that. But it's just funny that that is still a common impression that people have. Meanwhile, you know, high-end uh, neighborhoods of Atlanta, you got people selling their homes for uh, cryptocurrency and nothing else. In the millions. Except dollars. <laughs> right. We don't want any of that fiat. We know how worthless that's going to be. Yeah. You know? And most people don't realize the big banks and all the big institutions financially are all coming into cryptocurrencies. They are. Oh, Behind, they're not right. announcing it. Right. You know. Yeah, and, and blockchain technology in general uh, and distributed networks. I mean, this is such a technology of the future. I was just on Fox News last night and they asked me about, about this because, I mean, at this point, I think we should just get rid of the Federal Reserve uh, completely. I don't think it does any, uh, performs any positive actions and it just tempts a bunch of politicians to manipulate the money supply. Um, we just get rid of the Federal Reserve and then gradually watch the transition from, uh, from fiat to, to crypto take place over the next uh, 25, 30 years. I think that's, I think that's what's going to happen. That sounds like a perfect plan. Jeffrey, please tell us a little bit about your own background and how you became such a strong Bitcoin advocate. Yeah, well, I, you know, when I was back when I was uh, in college, I got really interested in the history of money because it, uh, I learned about this by reading about the Weimar inflation in Germany. I realized something extremely important. If your money falls apart, your civilization falls apart. So I got really curious about this because, you know, it was the failure of the Reichsmark in Germany that ultimately led to the rise of Hitler and the takeover of Europe by totalitarianism. And then you look at it otherwise, I mean, the failure of money led to the French Revolution, it led to the Bolshevik Revolution. It's just, money has been this, this sort of uh, really important aspect of uh, whether a nation is uh, thriving or dying. And so I just began to study it more and more, and I uh, became an economics major. I wrote my undergraduate thesis on the topic of gold, and I've been really interested. I was good friends with Murray Rothbard and, and so on. Um, and I've just been following the sector for a very long time. But one of my biggest frustrations I had was that all the plans for monetary reform always seemed to hinge very importantly on, uh, on the people who own and control the system doing the right thing and they never do the right thing. So I was really frustrated about this. Like how are you gonna reform money if you have to depend on the Federal Reserve to reform it for you? So um, I liked Hayek's idea that he wrote about in 1974 that we should just invent a private currency that's better. But I never really saw a way around that because during the early 2000s, we saw lots of attempts at this and they kept not working. Uh, so when Bitcoin came along, it was, just became really exciting because we saw for the very first time a truly viable, highly performing, peer-to-peer, -peer, geographically non-contiguous opportunity for indirect exchange that was totally secure um, and completely private, privately produced without having to rely on intermediaries, governments, or central banks. 
that is amazing. So of course I got really interested in it. Isn't it sad to know that the people that are at the top that could do the most good most times don't, you yeah. know, they deceive yeah. people on a massive scale and then no one wants to believe it. So they get caught in. Yeah. Well, I think what happens is they benefit from the system. And so they like the system as it is. Mm. Uh, the federal reserve uh, works hand in glove with big government and big banks and they, they exercise this, this power and they have this monopoly power. Um, but I don't think they're going to be able to hang on to it. Not in the age of cryptocurrency. You know, um, we have, uh, the, we live through a very interesting times of massive currency experimentation. Lots of people using gold and silver privately. Other people, there's a lot of local currencies in the United States. We've got um, very interesting currency-like things being innovated uh, across many sectors from Amazon to Sky Miles to, you know, everybody's got their, um, their, their discounts for loyal customers and those themselves become monetized. So I don't think there's any chance for the old system of a money monopoly to last much longer. It's gradually breaking down. That's good. That's very interesting. Now, give me a prediction. Do you think that we're going to have this system break down and completely be overhauled within the next 10, 50 years? What, what are your thoughts with the way? Well, I, think, I think things are going really fast. You know, um, it took about 70 years for railroads to go from just barely working to really uh, uh, changing the way we travel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the old days, technologies took a long time to kind of unfold. Uh, email took about 20 years to go from experimentation to mainstream use. Um, uh, and and, and from, from invention to mainstream use, it was probably closer to 30 years. Um, we're still 10 years into what I think is just, just on the 10th year, the most exciting innovation of, of modern times, if not since the Industrial Revolution. And I'm surprised at how much progress we've made so far. I think the next year, 10 years are going to be really exciting. And I'm guessing that in 10 years from now, we're going to look back at these years and see them at the, as a time of great transformation. Um, and, and the crypto will be a, a, an alternative. I don't think national monies are going to be gone by that point, but you never know. Because if the Federal Reserve or the money managers really botch it, people will just dump the dollar and move into uh, crypto. I've also noticed that um, we've got uh, state governments experimenting with receiving crypto for taxes, which is something that's really interesting. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't that? I just saw that yesterday. It's interesting you bring that up. Actually receiving cryptos for taxes on a state basis. Yeah. I just, yeah. yeah. For those of you that don't know that, that's just amazing to me. Yeah. I think Definitely. it'll be a while before the federal government does that, but we'll have to wait. And see. <laughs> exactly. We'll have to see what they have to say about it. It is yeah. always amazing to have you on this show. Please tell everyone how they can follow your work. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm posting on Twitter all the time at Jeffrey A. Tucker. Um, I write not every day, but almost every other day at the American Institute for Economic uh, Research. And I have a column in Forbes. So you can follow me all those different places. Everywhere. Mr. Jeffrey A. Tucker, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Researcher, speaker, author, the founder of the Cryptocurrency Conference, and advocate of Bitcoin. For Cryptocurrencies, the Future of Digital Money show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. Greg Manorino goes berserk on market manipulation. Trace Mayer calls the crypto bear market normal. Silver Bull, the famous Chris Duane, who mints his own coins, discusses triple-digit silver prices. Vortex breaks down how the end of the crypto bear market will catapult Bitcoin to new, fresh, all-time highs. Jim Rogers outlines exactly how the crash will happen, and Charles Nenner on major stock market crashes and gold crashes. Portfolio Wealth Global continues to pound the table that this bull market is not over in stocks. In fact, Starbucks, our latest stock profile, jumped from $51 to over $63 in no time as it opens a new China branch every 15 hours. Make sure to subscribe to the newsletter. As we reveal our picks for 2019, go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash money now.